Hello and welcome everyone to Active Lab. This is Active Lab live stream number 20.2. This is our second group discussion on the paper The Emperor's New Markov Blankets and today is April 27th, 2021. Welcome to Active Lab everyone. We are a participatory online lab that is communicating, learning and practicing applied active inference. You can find us at our links on this slide. This is recorded and an archived live stream, so please provide us with feedback so that we can improve on our work. All backgrounds and perspectives are welcome. And we'll be following video etiquette for group live streams like muting if we're not going to be talking and raising our hands so that we can hear from everyone. We're down here on the bottom of the slide in the second discussion for the Emperor's new Markov blankets and closing out April with this really great discussion. So check out this link rb.gy slash kvn pyc if you want to see what's upcoming for the different streams. The goal of today is really just to continue this awesome exploration and learning and discussion that we've been having and really appreciative that the authors are here to be talking about it with us. So we'll be able to ask some cool questions and anyone who's watching, feel free to ask a question in the live chat and we'll relay it to the group. Today, we're just gonna be going wherever we need to go. We'll start with introductions and then if people wanna call out a specific figure or a specific question, uh, or especially reference a quotation in the text or just something that they've prepared, that would be really great. So we'll just go around and introduce everyone and say hello. Feel free to just introduce yourself however you'd like and give a short check-in. And then after we have an introduction round, we can return to these warm-up questions and anyone can feel free to chime in on one of these questions, such as what they're excited about. So I'm Daniel, I'm in California, and I will pass it to Shannon. Hey everyone, I'm Shannon. I'm usually in California, but I'm in South Dakota for the pandemic, and I will pass it to Stephen. Hello, I'm Stephen. I'm in Toronto, and uh, I'm doing a practice-based PhD through the uh, Solomon School of Applied Psychology, and I will pass it to um, Scott. Hello, um, Scott David from Seattle, Washington, and at the University of Washington Applied Physics Lab. And uh, we're working on synthetic intelligence. And I will pass it to, wait, I lost my list. <laughs> who, hasn't, who hasn't chatted yet? Uh, Dean, have you had a chance? Hi, uh, I'm Dean. I'm from Calgary. Uh, I'm retired. And uh, I just like hanging out here because I learned a few things. And I'll pass it to Chris. Hi, I'm Chris. Uh, I'm a postdoc at the Ruhr Universität in Bochum in Germany, but I'm joining from Berlin today and I'm one of the authors on the paper. And I'll pass it to Joe. Uh, thanks, Chris. I'm uh, Joe Dewhurst. I'm a postdoc at the Munich Center for Mathematical Philosophy, also one of the authors on the paper. Um, my background's in philosophy of neuroscience and computer science, primarily, I'd say. Thanks. Uh, I'll pass to Yella. Hi, everyone. Uh, happy to be here uh, again. I'm Jelle Bruineberg, also one of the authors of the paper. I am currently based in Amsterdam, although I'm supposed to be in uh, uh, Sydney, Australia. Um, yeah, uh, happy to be here. Uh, today. Today's the uh, birthday of the Dutch king, so it's a special day. Happy birthday. Okay, I think that's everyone with the introduction. So anyone, please feel free to raise your hand and start off. Some of the warm up questions are, what is something that you're excited about today? Could be related to the paper or tangentially. What's something that you liked or remembered about the paper or from our discussion last week? And what is something that you're wondering about or you'd like to have resolved by the end of today's discussion? Maybe another question would be, what kind of momentum or what kind of next steps would make sense? You know, emerging from this, whatever we end up resolving or not in the next conversation, where will that take us 
in our research or in our practice journeys, I guess. So Joe, and then anyone who'd like to speak. Uh, thanks. Um, do I need to lower my hand again or is that done? Uh, it's just good. Good, great. Uh, cool. So I missed the discussion last week, so some of this may have already been covered. But one thing which relates a little bit to something we were discussing just before we went live here, and I think is kind of um, a broadening of the points we wanted to make in the paper, which I which I wonder about is uh, what what the if if active inference can be kind of arbitrarily applied to any given case, given the right kind of setup and parameters and so on. Um, what does this mean for its future application? Is this insofar as it's too general, or is this a strength insofar as it can be used anywhere, really? Um, and this, this I think, is kind of lurking underneath some of the points we make in the paper. So that, that's a more general point. Cool. So can active inference apply to anything and everything? Would that be a strength, or would that be a weakness? Awesome question. Any other Thoughts? Anyone wants to raise their hand? Yeah, Stephen? Yeah, I'd be interested to um, learn more about the way that the, the Pearl Blankets and the Friston Blankets um, interpretations might be useful in applications and how that might inform, you know, the way that modeling is done. So that that's kind of exciting for me. So that's one thing that I'm, I'm looking forward to. Great question as well. The um, distinguishing different kinds of blankets and even pulling back to like what kind of metaphors will we use and how will we relate technical terms to different settings, different practices. Those are some big questions we want to address. Scott, and then anyone else? Yeah, I, I'm interested in, in all in both of those questions or all that aspects, and then also the frizzle of the paradox of those two questions. So it's a chicken and egg question of Friston, or not Friston, of active inference, in a sense, right? We're observing something, we're projecting it out as a teleology onto the world, and then asking if it's a good teleology, right? So it's so in a way, it's like if you go for the David Bohm idea that all reality is first a thought. That includes the realities that we don't create entirely, but that we project. So to one of the questions I have, so as a, I was a practicing lawyer for 30 years or 25 years ish. And when I see active inference, I think contracts. And so I think of it as biomimicry of what we can do socially and project further with real intention to control systems. So that so what I'm wondering is, and, and I think both are valid, but the so ultimately is it a notion? I'll use the word biomimicry, but obviously I don't mean in the physical sense. But from us to learn from deep time, what we can do as biological organisms to better organize ourselves, despite our social elements. So to get back to our biology in a way, and and maybe organize ourselves a bit better and more resiliently with re reference to that. Anyway, it's a, that's the frizzle I'm interested in is the both the cause being upward and downward with regard to active inference. Thank you. Cool, and connecting the micro and the macro, it's sort of, sometimes it's laid out abstractly like multiple spatial scales that are nested within each other or time scales. But then when we talk about action and we have the example of sort of the person in a maze and you take a step back so that you can go around that's the kind of settings where we might want to apply active inference where the initial action might be non-linear or away from the goal in a sense but it's part of a policy trajectory that actually gets you where you want to be so and the other the other part of it is with the markov blankets being a bayesian notion because of the beige, then you say, oh, when does Bayes, when is Bayes effective? Well, that becomes a pretty broad application, right? Because I always say to people to get them in the space, I always say, if you're in a dark forest with no flashlight, you don't run full speed ahead. You stick out your hand in front of your face, right? And that's basically active inference. As I say, you don't, you know, you, you want to know what's in front of you before you run into a tree, right? So anyway, good stuff. Thank you. Any other, yep, Yella, and then anyone else. 
Yeah, so uh, I think last week we ended the uh, discussion on Shannon's point on what it means to have a folk, folk psychological form of active inference. And I think it related to the, uh, to the tension between needing to have a very deep mathematical understanding of an increasingly kind of developing field of maths and applying these kind of more broad set of ideas uh, to a particular kind of case. So I thought this was a, a, a point to explore further and, and think about how this would look like this, uh, this more kind of folk psychological way of understanding active inference using the concepts maybe without the nitty gritty details of mathematics. Shannon? Yeah, um, I was hoping that we could bring that up today and maybe ask Joe's take. Um, and also sort of if we're if we're talking about something like a Friston blanket and that's supposed to be a real demarcation of a system or a Pearl blanket, which is supposed to just be a, a how we describe the system, um, then maybe in this, you know, folk psychological notion of active inference or talking about how a phenomenon appears to this person in a crowd versus another person in a crowd where both phenomenons are real, but depending on which one you decide to model, you'll get a different picture of how the crowd's dynamics are changing. And we could model that mathematically, but just as easily someone in the crowd could have an informed notion of what it is that they're receiving and how it seems that the Markov blankets however they are, are emerging around the crowds in certain ways. And you could start having a discussion that maybe you can you know, translate from the scientists doing the fancy math and the person in the crowd who's just existing. Thanks, very interesting. Stephen, then anyone else? Yeah, just building on that, I think I'm also curious um, because there seems to be there's two sides there seems to be this primordial soup which is referred to in the paper as well and the variational free energy and how that can self-organize um and then um and that happens at smaller distances and then these longer distances where you've got expected free energy because the organism is, is seen into the environment with sensory information and often it's using these partially observable observable Markov decision processes for modeling that. And I'll be just curious if those two domains of modeling, which seem to come up, and I know there's more, but those two seem to come up a lot in the, the literature, how that pans out maybe with some of these questions of, you know, is there an intuitive feeling of how the morphology is moving towards a target, which could be that deeper sort of knowing of the body. And then there's this kind of partially observable decision process, which is kind of cognitive sort of looking in the world and, and which ones are more or less like Markovian in some ways and, and how does that affect how we try and uh, play with them, which is, or model them or play with them, which I think Shannon was saying in a way is, in a good way, is, is exploring these ideas phenomenologically. Thank you, Scott. And then anyone else? So Stephen's notion got me thinking about the notion of glass. In glass, they frequently talk about first order, second order, third order, order. Um, and so you have that amorphous material. It's semi-amorphous solid, right? So it's not really crystalline, not really liquid. So it has these orders that are discernible through different framings of maths. And it made me think about Stephen when you were saying that cognitive glass in a sense that we have this orders of order that we project onto disorder <laughs> and so we those teleologies um ultimately roll up into things like sovereignty which is seen as perfect order in the abstract right the sovereign does not need to ask for permission or forgiveness because it is the, it is the quintessence the fifth element right? It is not earthly. So we have this metaphysics that happens at the bottom or top of the turtle stack, depending on which direction you're going. And so it's, and I think that's kind of nice here. Hey, Blue. I think that's kind of nice here when we look at order and abstraction. Um, and the last point about it is that, you know, Kandinsky, the artist, 
said that violent societies yield abstract art. And so one of the things I always wondered is, is abstraction the reverse of violence? So if we look at sovereignty as being a total abstraction, as I just described, maybe sovereignty is also total violence. And Mills said that the sovereign has the monopoly of legitimated violence. So anyway, those are a few ideas about maybe we're looking at cognitive glass here with different orders of order that we can uh, project onto the system. And maybe that helps us when those when we look about order as levels of abstraction, as you get further from the first and second order into the third and fourth order, maybe it starts to be something that starts to yield a more projective or teleological element. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Dean, and then anyone else? Yeah, I, so I, I wasn't part of the, the tile uh, formation last week. I was kind of in the background and then lost it, but I did go back and watch the, the whole thing. And I'm hoping that uh, Chris has a few more things to say today about construal because um, that to me is kind of the the inflection point. And I, he was starting to talk about some of those things and the separation between, uh, what did he have, model and target. I think at the end of the day, um, if we were to give a lay person or some, I think the term folk has been used. I think if we give them a Markov blanket and a Pearl blanket, um, a lot of people will go, how does that, change my basic question, which is, how do I get the world? I think that's what all of us here are trying to do. And I think for a lot of people who aren't even aware of what a Markov blanket is or free energy principle is, they still want that basic question answered. So I'm really interested to find out today how the paper moves us to a place where that becomes easier, that the obstacles to getting the answer to how do I get the world suddenly flatten and become, I don't know, more familiar? Thanks, Dean. And a thought on the cognitive glass and what you just said there. So framing it in big terms about sense making, sense making about the world as well as about active inference is really helpful. And Scott, when you mentioned the cognitive glass, I thought about oobleck. It might be called different things, different places, but it's cornstarch and water. And so when you slap it really hard, it's like a resilient boundary and your hand comes away dry and it's like you're hitting a piece of concrete. But then if you go very slowly, it kind of is like a liquid. So it's an amorphous solid like the glass. Now, the boundary between the air and the oobleck is something that is real about the world. And so there's a distinction there. But it's almost like depending on how the boundary is crossed, not even like two different types of things. They're both touch but it's actually the dynamics of the stimuli that dictate whether the response is going to be very stubborn and more like a solid or whether it will be very giving. And again, it's not like it's light versus sound, two different sensory inputs. This is different quantitative differences within one interface modality. And it just shows how even when there's a clear boundary in the world, we think like between um, two phases, still the behavior of the interface can be very dependent on the type of interaction. So Scott, and then anyone else. Made me think, is it Skinnerian all the way down? Or do you have myriad Skinnerian vectors intersecting and we see that as complex? Steven, then anyone else? I think you could also see this question around glass um, because glass at a certain way of freezing or becoming solid it doesn't crystallize it doesn't break up it you can still see through it so you've got this question of it being part of the medium through which information can pass because you can see through it but there's also that question around that goldilocks zone when if you want something to rearrange and be the material like happens in the primordial soup Kristen talks about there's a, you know, too low a temperature, it sort of just becomes a solid, too high a temperature, it's going to dissipate and start to, so you've, you've got a bit of the overlap between, you know, internal, external, solid, liquid, um, map territory, it's kind of interesting. interesting. 
yes, different phases of the mind for sense making too rigid or too fluid. So um, Joe, then Scott, and then anyone else who'd like to speak. Uh, thanks. Yeah, so this this just made me think that quite quite a few of these points, for me at least, come back to a kind of central thing. So so Shannon's question about folk psychology, which I'm very interested in, or kind of folk inference, um, questions about teleology and uh, questions about, you know, whether whether it's just something simple all the way down, which makes it look like it's complex. Um, to me, makes me think that there's an important question here about the role of um, perspective and kind of viewing of these systems going on. And and the way I see it, a lot of a lot of the more teleological things that we project onto these systems, um, some e even even like a boundary perhaps isn't isn't really something we should uh, take to be in the system, but is rather just something we're uh, kind of modeling the system as having. So so it comes back to that target model question as well. Um, so just just a central question here of what we take to be really in the world and what we take to just be part of our understanding of the system of the world. Cool. Thank you, Scott. And then anyone else? I love the conversation because everyone is moving so nicely and easily and with such uh, facility back and forth between the metaphysics and the physics and appropriately. And I don't mean I don't mean this is not a diminishment, right? Because that we're we're demarking those edges. One of the things here that occurred to me in the last couple of notes is the notion of seed crystals. Because we are talking about phase changes in system behavior, I think. There's very often a threshold kind of trigger type of thing that happens. And so that notion that Stephen was bringing up about phase seems interesting. And that was implicit in what you were saying about cornstarch as well. And so one of the things I think is interesting is what do those triggers look like and how are those encoded? And, and, and so when you're talking about popular encoding versus of some biological encoding. So let's say my I'm triggered into anger, but then that anger takes on the symbol of a certain person in a political party or whatever, right? There's different stages of phase change that are happening there of solidity that are being offered to that glass-like structure of order that are being set up by those externalities. And it seems like one of the things, we just did a, a, a paper on misinformation with a group. And one of the things that's so in interesting to me is it's not a single event, misinformation. It's not a binary where, oh, I got misinformation. How did I, how could I have prevented it? Like, you know, getting hit on the head with a stick. There's so many levels at which you can address misinformation and intercede and intervene. And this feels like one of those exercises that perhaps we can start to identify interventions for information integrity by looking at where might we put in seed crystals to put in phase changes at stages of that process to redirect it in ways that are more socially or productive or whatever the goal is of the group. Thank you. Thank you, Scott, Stephen, and then anyone else? Yeah, I think this discussion also, it points to an important consideration bringing in the territory and the environment because a lot of these phase changes are in the world out there. Um, but also maybe unlike, say, the enamel of our teeth, which is maybe like glass in a sort of what you would call an equilibrium state. OK, it's at a low energy state. It's just there. Right. I don't expect it to keep moving that much. But we're talking about these non-equilibrium steady states. So you've got this kind of micro states which things can revisit from which some are more probable from which there's attractor states which becomes these macro states which then the organism at different scales is visiting so there's this interesting because there's both going on you know that i think sometimes everything's non-equilibrium steady state but you know i'm holding a computer here it's pretty thermodynamic equilibrium object you know i'm i'm, I'm in that world even if my body has a lot of non-equilibrium dynamics going on so that maybe plays out in some of these questions. Thanks, Stephen. Yep, a lot of uh, parallels, analogies, cross mapping between information and thermodynamics. And it's unsurprising, I guess, because there's a lot of groundwork there, but it really is a fruitful intersection. Maybe we can just remind ourselves of some of the questions that we had from last week, and then we can just continue walking along. So anyone just raise a hand. So 
uh, these were like loosely structured by topic, but we had big questions. How much mathematics is required to understand or work with free energy principle and active inference? And just how shall we speak and work clearly on this issue? Then we had a, a few questions on a philosophical side. We recalled the papers of Mel Andrews and Inez Hippolito and Thomas Van Ness, which were a footnote in this paper as sort of relevant contemporary work. So definitely on the philosophical side, I'm sure we could um, hear any thoughts about what next steps are on that line of research. And this question of how to think about blankets for groups, you know, if it's groups all the way down, then what's wrong with throwing blankets over groups? But what kind of blankets and what kind of groups? Also blue, if you want to introduce and give any thoughts, that's cool too. And of course, questions about what's real or not. Um, we had a few themes arising about, again, about math, and about how there is um there's multi-directional dialogue with active inference and other fields so what happens when we cross over between different areas scott and then anyone else so i want to talk about markov flags for a second and what i mean is the flag of amsterdam with the three x's my understanding is from a tour guide that the X's stand for fire, plague, and flood. And so if that's, let's assume that for a minute. And the idea was, if you see that flag, you better follow the club rules on preventing fire, plague, and flood, because that's what we do here in this area in Amsterdam, okay? So to me, that is a Markov blanket, because what you're doing is you're saying, hey, we are projecting this out come join the club we are doing bayesian analysis on how to prevent cholera and floods and fire in the city limits and that's a the signal is there on top of every building that is has an owner who conforms to the rules and so i want i wondered if we can do a markov blanket analysis on the amsterdam flag as a markov flag expressing and saying, all ye who come here, right? It's like Diogenes looking for an honest man. I'm looking for plague preventing and flood preventing people here. So to me, that's a projection out in, 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 in any other kind of active inference. We're projecting out through a flag instead of sticking our hand out to search for a tree. So that's active. And then I'm doing regulatory enforcement, which seems to me to be a body that is responding to nonconformity among its members. So could you comment on whether that's a possibility in terms of projection out of social elements of Markov blankets possible? Any Amsterdam resident is welcome to respond. Uh, Shannon, and then anyone else who raised their hand. <laughs> Not an Amsterdam resident. Um, but yeah, so now we're talking about something like cumulative, cumulative culture and our evolution of, of signs and symbols and how we co-construct meaning in space. So maybe the flag, if you don't know what it means, it's just the flag. Um, you might not even know it's a flag. If you see it painted somewhere, it's just something that looks cool and has some shapes. But if you have been raised or taken a tour, I guess, um, in the culture, surrounded by the symbols, surrounded by the meaning, all of those small instances of negotiating meaning and like we talked about active semantic inference. I can't exactly remember what that conversation was last week, but this seems like it could be similar, sort of adding meaning. And if the flag doesn't mean to the person you're interacting with what you thought it would mean to them, you take action in your world to make it mean the thing to them that it means to you. Um, it's an interesting thread. I like that idea. Also, one thought on the uh, flag before we go to an Amsterdam resident is like a blanket you think about under the blanket or inside the blanket, like there's a person or a blanket goes on a bed. But a flag is also fabric and it's flying in the wind. And 
the borders it delineates are not on one side of the air versus the other side of the air, but as the flag is animated by the niche through winds, otherwise it's just on the flagpole, it delineates a social barrier or a social um, demarcation, which is an encultured and in a, in a intersubjectively negotiated experience, just like you brought up, Shannon. So Yella and then Stephen. All right, thanks. Um, that's fascinating. Uh I'm not sure I, 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 I know the story yet from the three crosses. I, I think I have a different <laughs> origin story, but maybe this is in the tour guide, so I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think this raises also points to, to one of the questions uh, Joe was raising in the beginning, right? Which is in turn like, suppose we can give this analysis of the flag of Amsterdam as a Marco blanket, and we can give an analysis of uh, the origin of life in terms of Marco blanket and, and and lots of things in between, right? So what 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 does this multi applicability of of uh, Marco blanket say? It, it could one it could point to a very deep self similarity that runs through nature at all possible scales, uh, or or it could mean that the toolbox is 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 in a sense too coarse grained to to so that it applies to everything but 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 you can't really make uh the relevant differences right i mean in, in a sense you would like to think through what are the differences indeed through a kind of uh uh signs of group memberships in in in, in social situations versus uh more biological signs versus a, a, a kind of self-organization self-organization in physics and i think that that's that's kind of the tension between the kind of applicability to everything uh, and and how particular you would like your 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 theory to be. Thanks. So Stephen, then Scott, then anyone else. I mean, this is also brings that question. I think, like was just mentioned there, around where we put things in a Markov blanket, we, and where things are part of this uh, external states, um, hidden states, internal states, because. I mean, in some ways, from the Markov blanket perspective, the sensory states of the epithelia, the, the kind of sensory organs, is what's been stimulated. And it's inferring an external state in the world, i.e. the flag. Um, and that's having an additional inference that the flag has got this meaning at another level. So um, I'm not even sure what the whole thing is called in some ways, because... Is the blanket because the blanket is dependent on connecting with external and internal, but it's normally just those that part of the of the whole active inference um, dynamic. Um, so I think that that becomes interesting is where what type of uh, sensory input information is within the blanket biologically, and maybe that isn't quite the same as what is thought of when we start talking about it and that may be good or maybe a problem thanks so scott then chris then anyone else this is uh this is fantastic this discussion so um i realized all of a sudden i thought oh wait a second i just realized that some of these folks may actually be empiricists and may believe there is a a, a testable reality out there i didn't because i'm not that person <laughs> so i i made a living in rhetoric and a persuasive speech right as a lawyer right so for me it's all projection so i realized i was i was a too diminishing of the question of whether there exists something out there to test and i was looking at and this whole thing to me this has been a candy store since a few months ago where i learned about active inference because to me it's all um, a, a, about avoiding avoidable harms among humans. And to the extent that active inference is universally uh, assertable, then it has a rhetorical power that's huge, right? So if we can get people thinking they're surrounded by active inference blankets, and then I say, you know, you don't have an active inference blanket yet in the way you're doing business with other people in your supply chain, or you don't have active inference blanket yet in the way that you're interacting among nation states, or you don't have active inference yet in your food insecurity supply chain or your cybersecurity, all these other things that I'm working on right now, contact tracing, la 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 la. It's information systems where because they're not within the same uh, model, then they have conflict. 
And those most of those are avoidable harms because they're just humans working out stuff that we were separated for 100,000 years when we migrated out of Africa. And now we're getting back together and trying to compare notes on what we came up with. So uh, the question or this assertion is that it's interesting. I, to me, it's not that troubling a question of whether these exist or not. And, I'm, and I've read lots of philosophy and I've been down the road there. But ultimately, it's the, uh, the I say yes and on, on that question of whether it exists or not. It, it, to me, it's a provisional truth that's functional, sufficiently functional. So I'm not no longer curious about whether it has an existence separate from the human mind. So, that, so take my comments with a salt lick, not a, a grain of salt, but a giant block of salt. Because I realize I'm, I'm an old old person and I just don't care if it actually exists separately. And I'm not saying that to say this conversation doesn't matter. It's awesome. But it's that but the dynamics of rhetoric are such that we can employ the thing to do good whether or not it's real. So Scott has litigated realism versus instrumentalism. He's serving as the judge, jury, executioner, lawyer. Um, Chris, and then Joe, then Blue. Yeah, thanks a lot. So um, I think there's a like there's a there's a useful way to to think of the flag metaphor, so to speak, and to bring it a little bit closer, maybe to to also what Scott was saying now and and the paper itself. So the question that the paper is trying to answer, right, is kind of to what to what extent is the Friston blanket construct or the Markov blanket construct as used by Friston a conventional thing? So, you know, th there are different kind of, like you, you can have different views, of course, about the metaphysics of mathematics and so on and so forth, but generally there's some agreed rules about how maths works uh, or certain branches of mathematics work. And that's where the Markov blanket construct comes from, right? It comes from statistics. And uh, there's a clearly defined way of using it. So the convention for using the Markov blanket is very clear. It was introduced very clearly by Judea Pearl in uh, his article and later his book uh, at the break of 80s and 90s. And there's no kind of mystery or, you know, there's no question about how it should be applied productively. So whether or not you you think that science is after capturing the reality as it is or whether you think science only gives us approximate truths or some kind of you know um uh, approximate uh, models of what of of what's out there that that doesn't matter what's really important for us i think and maybe the guys can also uh, speak to that is that for Markov blankets, there is a clear convention for how to deploy them. And it's very clear what they are doing and what they can't give you. Whereas for f the way Friston applies the notion, first of all, he kind of softens the convention. The convention is less codified, we can think, we can say. It's less clear to what extent they apply where. And similarly, it's less clear what you can get out of it, right? So this is the um, this is kind of the problem. So, so Stephen, for example, mentioned something about you know boundaries and the fact that whenever there's an interaction, these mar mark of uh, sorry, these blankets. Let's leave the mark of part of the name out of it. These blankets appear and or they can be found there, and it's not entirely clear whether, according to Friston, they will be found at every. Uh, in every place where we have an interaction between two systems, for example, or something like that, right? Because the the the, the rules uh, in which they are applied are not as clear as as in the case of the original Markov blanket construct. And I just wanted to also to follow that up on this very quickly. In the version of the paper that's under review now, we actually realized that perhaps in the draft you've read, we were a little bit... Uh, too harsh on Friston because he does impose certain rules about, for example, how to individuate different kinds of nodes. But there's still a question of kind of what what it means to individuate these nodes in a certain way. Thank you, That's uh, it. Joe. Thanks, Joe. If you wanted, then Blue and Scott. 
Uh, I'm fine for now, actually. Thanks. Thank you. Blue, and then Scott. So without specifying Markov blanket or Pearl blanket or Friston blanket, I want to touch back on what Yellow was saying about group memberships and also about uh, what Shannon was saying about cumulative culture. So I think this is a, like a really interesting notion of um, like a Markov blanket or a blanket overlying a group and and the affordances and like what it means to be part of that group like age specific affordances or socioeconomic specific affordances under a given blanket and how and when this like cultural or group membership prior gets like instilled and also like do blankets then overlap like i'm of this race and of this age and of this you know, so so these overlapping blankets, I just think it's a very interesting um, idea about group membership and cumulative culture. And we might know that we're part of this group, but we don't know all of the specific underlying backstory about why we're treated this way or we're afforded these certain things. I just think that's a very interesting way to think about it. Thank you, Blue. Scott, and then anyone else, and also anyone who's watching live is welcome to ask us a question. So it's so interesting. A couple of things, Blue, on what you just said. So I do a lot of sewing, and with the notion of quilting is really interesting in what you just said, because there are actually a bunch of quilting museums that do ethnographies of quilts. And so it really comes back around. You have this quilt which reflects a person's history, like when they did the HIV quilt, it, each square represented a person, right? So you actually have a physical membership instantiated in this blanket. And then the blanket being the symbol of the community being knit together. I mean, all these knits probably not the thing you want to do in a quilt, but anyway. Okay, the, the thing I was going to uh, uh, mention in, re in response to Joe, I think it was Joe's comment before about the, oh no, sorry, it was um, it was Christoph's about the um, application and the alteration uh, from the paper, that notion that you have this um, there's something that's running as a scientific, a statistical concept that is brought out in the world. One of the things, so I, as I mentioned before, I work in an applied physics lab. Now, applied physics is really funny because you're applying physics. So that seems like maybe it has something to say about what's going on here. And I, and I realized, well, what you do in applied physics and what we do in our program, in, in specifically in our program, we take technically feasible systems. So let's say that we could describe something as technically feasible. The, the, uh, the uh, Friston notion is technically feasible and you can apply it in, in scientific context. Um, but what I do in my program and what the lab does generally is then we take the stuff and make it ready for adoption in the field. So in specifically in my program, I take technically feasible systems and I test them for whether they're bolts reasonable and bolts is business, operating, legal, technical, and social. So if something is technically feasible, like the Orion project where they were gonna use nuclear bombs to loft weighty objects into space, that's totally technically feasible, but it would be unreasonable socially because you'd pollute the entire at atmosphere with radioactive isotopes, right? So it works in the lab, it's theoretically good, terrific. So what I'm, my notion is maybe what's going on here is the applied physics, applied statistics. And when you get it out there in the field, it's it's can be seen we can call them compromises or we can call them realities or we can call them affordances or we can call them bayesian adjustments of scientific empirical views right which when it gets out there in the reality maybe the folk understanding is the reality of physics in the mind of the of humans maybe the, if the mind exists in society and the brain's just an antenna tuned into it Anyway, just a couple of thoughts to play with. Thanks, Scott. So Stephen, and then anyone else who has a question? Yeah, I'd be interested, Christoph, just further in what you said about uh, what does it mean to individuate a node in a particular way and this idea of nodes. And I suppose at this larger scale, um, I'm seeing with these partially observable Markov decision processes being used in some of the modeling they don't necessarily from what i understand talk about nodes in that way but at the primordial soup kind of cellular level they seem to often talk about nodes in that maybe in in the similar way or not but i'd just be curious what your th thoughts are about what it means 
to have a node, what kind of node that might be and what's similar or different between different ways that this is implemented. Yep, go for it, Chris. And I have figure two up or let me know if you want to go to a different figure. Uh, sure, thanks a lot. I mean, it, those two, the, the last two comments and the question, Stephen, really match nicely together, I think, because so, you know, I mean, you can we can talk about variables, right? I mean, in a in a graphical model, variables are represented as nodes, basically. So, what, but what I, of course, meant is the differentiation of uh, uh, the differentiation between active states and uh, passive of, or perceptual states, inter inner states. Uh, yeah, exactly. Well, you can also use the loop, but yeah, internal states, external states, um, these things, right? So it seems. To me, that uh, and I think I mean not only to me; it seems to, to all of us that there is a certain degree of arbitrariness with regards to what is what. I mean, at least in the draft you've read, it seemed like that to us. We then learned that after really reading a lot of Tristan's papers very carefully, we actually kind of extracted the implicit rules. For for how to how to you know label these variables as active or passive uh, in a graphical model, um, but this is still a very arbitrary distinction, one which is uh, like the rules by which you individuate. So I I used individuation here. Maybe I shouldn't have used the word individuate. The way you identify the role played by a given variable. That's what I should have said previously is the, the rules that, that give you this identification are still very arbitrary and they are not actually anchored in anything very substantial. And this goes back to what Scott said about uh, feasibility and applicability, because of course you can take this kind of way of partitioning a system, you can build a robot with you know some kind of uh, AI system which will be built on the principles of the free energy principle and Friston's uh, way of thinking about graphical models, and it will be perfectly, you know, good at doing certain things that you build it for. The problem is that when you're building a system for a particular purpose, as an engineer, you kind of hold all the cards. You make all the decisions. You know, you decide like how to. What like what kind of active states will the robot need or something like that? And that's very that's a very different perspective, so to speak, of, from this perspective of uh, you know, let's call it the what Dennett calls the evolutionary R and D uh, department, right? So in uh, evolution doesn't really plan things. Evolution just throws things at the wall and whatever sticks kind of stays and goes on to reproduce and all the other things kind of fall back, and um, in this sense, it's it's very it becomes very problematic when we think of like Priston's grand project of explaining you know life as we know it, for example, as in the paper from which we took this diagram that's on the screen now, because it's it slowly becomes a little bit suspicious whether we can actually whether the 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 the, the way he labels these nodes and the 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 kind of the rules for labeling the nodes will be the same on, for example, different levels of organization, stuff like that, right? So, so whether this will be applicable uh, to many different biological systems in the way that he hopes it will be or not. Thanks. And just to, to clarify, um, you, you all wrote that uh, spectral graph theory is used to identify the eight most densely coupled nodes, which are defined as the internal states. So for those who think that given this soup of interacting particles, which are all the same kind, they're all following the same simple rules. Yeah, eight densely coupled ones. Okay, those are internal. And then there's some downstream consequences with which nodes influence which nodes. But it's hard to argue that choosing the eight densely coupled nodes is uh, simply, you know, true or internal when you can look at what it is and ask whether there's a different way to partition it. So Joe and then Scott and then anyone else. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Daniel. That's a very clear way of putting that point. Um, so, so just to pick up again on something Chris Chris mentioned briefly, there is there is a further individuation problem, I think, which is about how to identify which which nodes you have in the first place or which which variables you have. And this is a kind of grain question. So so you can always 
you know, look inside a node and split up into some other nodes or some other subparts. Um, and this this might not be a problem just that active inference suffers from. It's going to be any 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 kind of modeling uh, system is going to have this kind of issue. But it is going to make a difference to where where the boundaries are drawn and what what kinds of what kinds of things you get. So that's just to say that there's there's already a kind of human uh, involvement in the model and just choosing what scale you pitch your your nodes at. Thanks, Joe. Uh, Scott. Then Dean, Yella, and Stephen. So in that notion, love it. This is great. And that clarification about the nodes being assigned, in a sense, contextually in a given system state, um, it seems like if we start to, that may be a pathway to revealing the self-other, or uh, starting to unpack some self-other challenges. So maybe a node that is once characterizable as internal, then characterizable as external, is revealing something about the paradox of um, membership in groups. That the, in fact, it's not the node that changes, but the sensation of whether it's self or other. So you start to take that always paradoxical this is that Hofstetter stuff and everyone else who talks about when does a group become a when does a group form when does it have an internal voice when does it speak an external voice all that stuff and so maybe that analysis and that reassignment possibility starts to get into that and maybe that also informs blue's notion before about the group you know kind of the again the i'm, I'm calling it now the markov quilt as of that last conversation but that group identity blanket where it's patched together, maybe those things are um, like um, Irving Goffman and things like that, or mirror neurons, where you want something to be recruited by others as an internal state, you project it to them as an external state intrinsically. And so the communication, you're inviting others to encode their Markov blankets, similar to yours in a sense, or something like that. So that is exciting to me, that slipperiness of assignment there feels like something that offers a pathway to analyzing those dynamics of group and individual um, identity. Thanks. Thank you, Scott. So Dean, Yella, and Stephen. And Blue. Yeah. Um, so back to construal and the question of how do I get the world? I think a lot of the conversation today has centered on maybe a, a more clunkier expression, which is how do us get the world? Either us as flag conformists or us as red dots versus cyan dots. Um, so even Priston, Stephen shared a, a video where he was talking to the Santa Fe Institute. Even Priston said that things get a lot more interesting when we get to the combinatorial level and they're not the same as when we're talking about how do I get the world, that there is, there is a difference when complexity arises. So can we hold up Pearl and Markov blankets and, and get past the or of this or that, because we recognize that it's a little bit different when how do us get the world? That's a construal question. And so that's what I'm kind of curious about. Thanks, Dean. Really powerful and a big difference between how do us get the world? How do we get the world? How do I get the world? How do they get the world? These are like really markedly different questions. So Yella, Stephen, Blue. Um, so I was uh, thinking of getting back to Blue's question and Shannon's questions on, on group membership, but maybe if somebody else wants to... Uh, well, I, 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 I just get talking on... the. Uh, a group membership. Um, so, I mean, to what extent one the kind of marker blanket formalism applies to 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 groups? Uh, I think is an interesting one, and I think that that's a, what one thing that's really uh, matters here is is really how you conceive of a group, right? I mean, you can indeed like a, a group of people. I mean, we are a group of people that is spread out all over the world. And you could think like a group in the more narrow sense, like a flock of birds or uh, a, a, a school of, you say school of fish? I think so. Uh, 
And um, uh, these are entities in the same kind of spatio-temporal uh, location that coordinate their, their, their behavior with one another. And you can think of as, as a predator arriving or so as a perturbation to that system as a whole. Right? So in a way, that entity is coordinating its, 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 its dynamics with, with, with the rest of the environment. You might actually think, like, no, this is a group that actually to which the active inference uh, principles do apply. And you might, in that sense, might think as well that the group as a whole somehow has a has a has a has a has a marker blanket. Um, I think it's that analysis analysis is, is more difficult to give if you think about uh, uh, group memberships, uh, uh, also kind of the degraded group memberships, right? I mean, uh, I think Blue was talking about. Uh, yeah, we belong to multiple groups at the same time uh, and not actively acting on being part of that group, but just as a kind of label that, uh, that I would uh, endorse uh, uh, when you ask me. And I think there the application of Marco Blankets is a lot more difficult and at most more, 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 more metaphorical. So I, I just want to say, so exactly how to understand groups there is 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 important. If if Shannon wants to understand kind of crowd dynamics or so, that that might be more applicable. And if you want to really understand kind of social membership and graded membership and membership of different groups at the same time, then uh, yeah, I find I find it more difficult to understand how kind of the active inference framework can be applied to those kind of groups. Thanks. So Stephen, Blue, Scott. Yeah, I think sort of sticking with that group idea, that there could be the, the the idea of morphology and the amount of constraints and affordances in the the whole um, environment, body, organism dynamic that's constraining, uh, and where maybe there's not that constraint. So I'm thinking, I, I know someone actually is trying to do some Markov blanket meditation processes. I'm kind of thinking if someone's meditating and starting to just sense their states in a maybe a a way that slowly is like a cloud that self-organizes in a way i could see a more plausible way where a sort of something like not obviously anything the same as this kind of markov uh, blanket in a soup could be emergent however when you're in a you know a more real cognitive environment where you've got these priors and, and, and the only way we're able to access it anyway is through self-reported data, which we a, a much higher level of dimensionality. It, it maybe is, is only in some of the temporal processes that we can get some analogies like, but I think that, yeah, it may be very different at different scales. So um, the way that constraints play out, I'm wondering how we think about constraints um, and not having constraints. Nice question, Stephen. Are the constraints hooked into this phrasing? And that, or where are the constraints and how does that shape how we model things across different scales? So blue and then Scott and then anyone else. So hopefully I won't go on too long, but I want to touch back on what Stephen just said and also what um, Yella said. You know, when I think about how group membership goes into active inference, like how, how can we relate these two things? I think about like specifically, what is the likelihood that I'm going to take a ride on a yacht today, right? Like, so my socioeconomic status doesn't really afford me the opportunity to ride around in yachts very frequently. So I'd be very surprised. And I also live in the desert. So <laughs> I'd be very surprised if if I was riding around on a yacht at three o'clock this afternoon, like that would that just doesn't go into my model. So perhaps our group membership um, goes into, you know, construction of the, of the prior um, and our model in ways that are maybe layered, right? Like, you know, an onion maybe. Um, and so then I want to touch back on what Scott said, because this is what really made me raise my hand about group alignment. And we were starting to talk with Casper Hesp when he was on the stream about um, inferring the states of others. So I, I think this group alignment, I, I wonder about this a lot. And, and uh, specifically, with respect to communication, which we've talked about in relation to active inference and cooperation and, and you know, uh, building a collective intelligence. So when we think about 
you know, whether the earth is flat or not, right? Like this at one time was like a hotly debated topic and maybe still is, but um, <laughs> this is like, there's been a convergence, right? So we all now align or, or like most of the people in the world agree that the earth is round. So I, I wonder about this time to convergence and this has been used to measure information transmission and can we similarly use it to estimate collective intelligence. So like when we, there's a time to convergence for a swarm, or this might also represent like a phase transition, right? So there's a time to convergence. And if it happens rapidly, like the idea is readily adopted that now the earth is round. So I wonder if these divergent views that we have as people in groups, in divergent groups in a society, that uh, do they hinder our collective intelligence or do they like actually assist it? Because without having divergence, we could never actually come to the one true answer. So is it resistance that hinders the, the evolution of intelligence or is it, um, I, I just, it's something to think about. Thanks, Blue. Um, Scott, if you're, oh, go ahead, Shannon, yep. I just, can you repeat the question you asked right there at the end? Yeah, repeat, so, Blue. Yeah, so I just wonder about our, um, the divergent views, right, that we hold in society about whether the earth is flat or round, do, do, does this divergence help or hinder our collective intelligence and the evolution of intelligence overall? Or is it resisting a, adoption of a new view, right? Like, so perhaps there's there's resistance to change. Well, even when we see something is correct, like climate change, we can clearly see the effects of climate change, but there's a huge resistance to changing so is it this resistance that hinders our collective intelligence like what where is the evolution of our collective intelligence helped or hindered by divergence in views or resistance to adopting new views sorry that was long yeah shan you want to give a thought on that and then scott yeah um so if we were going to talk this would be like whether a system is resisting its non-equilibrium steady state and like moving to a different steady state. Um, and I guess that's a question I don't, I, like I've been seeing pop up in a lot of the papers recently is how can you define, not every system is going towards like a minimized free energy gradient or not every system is trying to maintain a stable state, like systems dissipate and reemerge and dissipate and reemerge. Um, so I don't know, maybe, is that just, that a way to re-ask that question, but talk about something a bit more physical than, than collective intelligence. Um, and I guess collective intelligence maybe is like collective agreement on a certain set of, of ideas or norms or something, rather than like intelligence, like smarter than another person is what we're maybe talking about here. So how does that system arrive on this steady state of what we think that the world is. Thanks, Shannon. And there's the convergence on shared generative model on shared mindset, but then it made me think of ant colony relocation. And over evolutionary time, colonies are shaped to appropriately relocate, but not instantly and not just choose the first, um, you know, first ant coming back with exciting nest location. You can't go for the first one. so how to actually bear with the process of distributed computation or distributed intelligence, knowing that it looks like disagreements at multiple levels, especially when it's not just as simple as ants relocating, but cultural values and, and beliefs and everything like that. So Can yeah. I jump in again about ants? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yes. There was, new, <laughs> there was a new paper and I don't know who it was by, I saw it on Twitter. Um, but it was about ants. Um, they travel across a scaffold and it's either it's like flat and so they just walk or they tilt it. And so some ants start to fall down and they start to build this scaffold. Um, and then when they build the scaffold, ants can all walk over it. So they're supporting each other. Um, and I'm thinking um, I might be diverging from our Markov blanket topic here, but I'm thinking um, that collective intelligence is like as long as the world looks flat, um, as long as the world is easy for us, you know, to navigate, then we can all go about our day. We don't really need to try to converge with anybody. But as soon as the world starts to be disrupted slightly, so we've turned that scaffold, folks start to fall off, like then we need to build something, build a shared collective notion of reality 
and then then the convergence matters and so that could be something like as soon as there's a perturbance to the system then it's useful to try to recognize boundaries or try to um, have some sort of intervention i think scott was mentioned to have a boundary that's suitable and helpful and productive and that could be where it's fine to diverge all you want as long as everything's simple and then as soon as it gets complicated or we start to uh, like have harm for people then we need to have a system that can result in some sort of convergence happy for great. someone to bring that back on topic <laughs> it's it's a great point and i almost interpret it as how do we help those at the fringe who might be being harmed how do we make that the stimuli and um for realignment and for re-scaffolding rather than keep on cutting off more and more. Oh, the failing parts of the bridge, they gotta go, they gotta go. Well, now we have no one on the bridge instead of seeing that those on the fringe and can be part of the recovery. So Scott, Christoph, and Steven. So Shannon, that was the right in the middle of the discussion. There's no, you don't have to bring back anything. That was perfect. <laughs> so Admiral Rogers, the former head of the NSA, once said, don't let any emergency or disaster go unexploited. And the idea is that the disaster is that situation. People act in a disaster, you know, Hurricane Sandy, whatever people, you know, Starbucks, they were putting out power strips for people to share, whatever, right? So it's exactly that. And the rhetoric, the projected projection rhetoric can cause a state change, right? The anticipation of a disaster when people are actually experiencing they go oh my god this might happen to me or neighborhood watch right people kind of you know they go in and they want to protect property and things so i love that that point and bringing it with the other points before i think it was christoph that was asking maybe somebody else about you know um that active inference in a group and does it dissipate in the activity if you're just a member of a club and it's kind of lying dormant is that really describable with active inference? And it occurs to me, you know, if you look at group dynamics, it may still be usefully described that way. And here's here's how I would think of it. If I, uh, this is Irving Goffman stuff that I, I project myself out as I want to be perceived by others. So if I join a club, I may join a club because I want to be like, I used to be part of an entomology listserv. Now, I've never been a this is not about Entenmann's cakes, but insects, you know. Uh, <laughs> but I was part of a listserv back in the old listserv days, and I just was fascinating. I sort of wanted to be involved in it, right? So I was projecting myself out, and I started making these connections with folks. So in a way, you can de-risk and leverage by being a member of a group even passively, right? I can, I'm can. i extending out my feelers out there into the world by having that group membership, I'm de-risking by having those, that group available to me as me being a member, if it's a group that, you know. So so I wonder if the dissipation of activity itself is an appropriate gauge of whether you're a member of a group or not. Maybe in certain leverages and certain de-riskings, there's a functional engagement that's maybe more passive by the individual, but still may stand for something in the overall goals of that entity that's so that's one point then the other one other point is the the leveraging the risk of groups i keep coming back to eukaryotes and eukaryotes you know we it's a better deal we got multicellular we got a lot more options we got mitochondria we got chloroplast we got all the good apparatus instead of having just these compartments where you kind of do stuff in a single cell organism right so it's a better deal and so maybe part of this thing with the groups this goes back to um blue's notion is is it uh, are we resist i think it was a blue maybe Shannon, but are we resistant to fill is, is this resisting um or facilitating the group membership what's going on here and you know the divergences and the differences and i started thinking about thermodynamics first law if you don't have if you have isothermy you can't perform cannot perform work if everyone has equal information markets don't have trading so there may be a benefit to not having to having divergence right and maybe in fact um the that reality is there isn't a facilitation or a resistance it just is and that paradox is what we're is the reality we're seeing is that it doesn't facilitate anything there's no goal 
orientation. Individuals may have goals, but that's a more bounded goal than the super system of biology. Anyway, just a couple of thoughts that I gleaned from that last bit. And also just to remark once again, what a fantastic conversation. Thanks, Scott. So Christoph, then Stephen, and then anyone else. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to, well, what did I want to say? Uh, I guess two things, really. So one thing goes back to Blue's comment about like the fact that the fact that if you have some kind of a complex network, there will be multiple Markov blankets in there. So it's completely feasible to understand, you know, membership to certain groups or something like that, or some kind of relationship structures to be overlapping in different ways. So I think that it's conducive to this. But I think that we should not, like, we're very focused now on this idea of, you know, blankets as um, as a way of, like, of thinking about some kind of boundaries again between groups, perhaps, or between different kind of units of organization. And we're not... Like it's 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 a it's always useful, I think, to kind of go back, you know, zoom out a little and not think about the blankets because you have the blankets whenever you have some kind of a network of of you know variables um, interconnected in some way. But what's really interesting is that in many cases the behavior you will get from these systems, if you project them onto the social domain, will be very surprising. So one really surprising finding is something called the Tolman effect. It's with a Z and double L. And it's basically um, a finding that shows that if you have Bayesian agents interacting in a network, if the network is fully connected, they won't actually come to a consensus about some true belief. So, so imagine you have a network of a fully connected network of Bayesian scientists and they're testing two hypotheses, right? And they're testing these hypotheses, they're increasing their credences and they're communicating their credences with each test to their neighbors. And what's really surprising is that the Tolman effect shows us that these scientists will not actually converge to a, to a singular credence in, in the true outcome. Well, what is also surprising is that a, a less connected network will actually eventually converge to the to the to, to kind of to all the members having a very high credence in the you know most likely outcome. So this kind of I just wanted to kind of throw it out there because I think that it's you know we're thinking now intuitively about these blankets as membership to groups and stuff like that, but the kinds of interactions we might get from using this kind of formalism and projecting it to a social domain might be quite surprising, right? I'm not saying it will be useless because perhaps the Tolman effect, to go also back to what has been said about the flat earth situation and, you know, the belief in the roundness or flatness of the earth, the Tolman effect actually tells us that in a hyper-connected society like the one we are living now, there, it's even rational agents might fail to converge to the to the you know the, the most likely hypothesis, right? And that actually is something interesting that it's in a way the Tolman effect predicts the appearance of certain conspiracy theories in a hyperconnected society because uh, given the demographics, for example, of flat Earth uh, belief, it has been declining for decades until the advent of internet so it only came to a sharp rise with the with with social net, uh, with social media when people started to communicate in a much more uh, interconnected way so i'm not saying that you know thinking about these systems in the social domain is bad no i just wanted to bring this let's say anecdotal uh, effect to to say that uh, the the kinds of behaviors we will see these systems uh, converging towards might be very surprising, right? Or we, we might, they, they might not work exactly the way we think they do on like lower scales of organization. Thanks for those points. So Stephen, and then anyone else? Yeah, that's some good points there, actually. And I think this is where active inference um, and the mark, uh, the Friston blanket has some advantages over the Pearl blanket if it's about 
what action it can it, there's a risk you see that information you start to have this thing that it's all information driven rather than action policy driven because it and by keeping it with the action policy um for instance one of the things about having us on a planet in a solar system which we used to have well now we know we're in a galaxy in a milky way blah 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 is that people have this sense of look we're almost meant to look at ourselves from space now which is really only a pro proviso of modern technological perspective people might want to be able to stay grounded in some way there may be actually a psychological challenge with having to take this out of space perspective of us on a little ball going around the sun you know so there could also be an action policy perspective here around flat earth gives you a way to reground yourself because it's like well i'm on a flat earth so i don't have to take that I, i'm not i don't have to go and imagine myself in space looking at myself so there's a lot of interesting aspects to the action policy side once you start to have this scaling and um that that could be interesting um to 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 keep that in mind thank you Stephen. joe and anyone else uh yeah thanks um just something you said there Stephen. uh when you say there's an advantage to the frist and blankets over the pearl blankets do you mean an advantage you know for for real systems making use of these things or an advantage for us as modelers so this is something that i that i really worry about sometimes that we slip into thinking about the practical benefits for a system of of these constructs whereas what we're really concerned with is the benefit it's for accurate and and in that context both might be good tools but when you use one tool or the other will depend on what you're trying to do with them i, I would say more for how we look at it as a modeler um, um although it, the actual thing gets called a system and then has this kind of perspectival process so i think it's good to keep it in mind so that action doesn't get lost and it doesn't purely start to become information yeah great no that that, that makes sense and um i wasn't necessarily accusing you of this error no, but no. sometimes i do worry that people uh people get mixed up over who who's getting the advantage i guess you know who's 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 benefiting here but but if if you mean just that it's important to keep to keep action as part of the picture and part of our models I, that that's a fair point yeah, yeah. and and one contribution of this paper and we look forward to the um revised and published version as well is like it's almost like if all we know is markov blanket it's like hey hand me the screwdriver well there's different shapes there's different sizes if you have the hex it's not going to work for the phillips and different countries or different applications need different screwdrivers so now we can with these adjectives ahead of blanket we can start to differentiate hand me the phillips screwdriver okay you're talking about the Friston blanket. You're talking about the Pearl blanket. And so we can be specific now because it's almost like enough air was pumped into the Markov blanket metaphor. It was becoming too big of a tent, too big of a blanket. And so now we can start to be really specific and, and address those kinds of questions. When are we talking about utility for the system? When are we talking about utility for the modeler? which of course maps very closely to um, the distinguishing in uh, that you raised with inference with and inference within a model. So Scott, oh, okay. if any, if Joe, if you want to give a thought on that. And then uh, yeah. Can I, can I just, I'm really, so we're, we're already pleased with the reception this paper's had, particularly among the active inference community. And just, just for the reason you, you said there, that I think one thing we were worried about but people have seen is that there is meant to be this more positive message that these aren't necessarily bad tools they're just different tools for different kinds of cases so i'm 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 really glad that people have seen that and kind of taken that as a helpful message it's it's the yes and approach to the literature it's not blood sports it's not a knockdown drag out with citations we can just build upon each other and uh, come to more useful and good ways of communicating so Scott and anyone else. Yeah, just two points. One, along those lines, in, in law, one of the most effective strategies for disambiguating something is saying what it isn't, right? And so even if you don't know what it is, you can at least start to say what it isn't. And so that's a, a handy notion along the lines here. And, and as the last couple of comments we're observing, we had this thing out there that was very exciting. And we kind of, everyone was playing with it. 
and said, oh, yeah, and it's the same thing that's happened in privacy. The word privacy is just carrying water for all sorts of anxieties right now. The word trust has all sorts of procedures. So the part of the problem with language is we got a lot of subtlety and a lot of interactions. Interactions are increasing exponentially. True exponential increase in interactions globally is an assertion that I make, at least. And if you think about that, we still have a vocabulary that's the same as it was way down the exponential curve of interaction increase. So how do we capture our subtleties in our interactions, right? How do we expand our vocabulary? Well, it's exactly what we're talking about here is we take words, we use them by analogy in other areas, right? We've already talked about blankets. Well, these aren't really blankets at all. And in fact, we get hijacked by the notion of blanket. We've already seen that. We're starting to use those. Is it a blanket or is it a membrane? Well, is it semi-permeable? Well, a blanket's not really semi-permeable, you know, that kind of stuff, right? So it's fascinating that we have, this is the, the appropriate and um, very exciting challenge to have to the taking it and run running with it idea early on in disambiguation. And it means that there's a lot of energy, which means there's a lot of need for whatever it is that's being served by the concept. And so what you're, as modelers, this is, gets kind of interesting, kind of gets into Manhattan Project kind of ethics of science, right? Because as modelers, you do have a responsibility and you're discharging it here by saying, hey, what does this mean for society? You know, should we develop nuclear energy unfettered with re regard to whether it can be used as a weapon, right? Because this is, this is powerful stuff here. And so that raising of the notion and the questioning of whether it's appropriate to apply these things socially is going to come up very quickly as people do things like the rhetoric that I'm talking about and start to apply it politically and start to recruit biases using these concepts that will be seen as a nefarious application of a scientific and mathematical and statistical concept. And so your paper and the questions you're raising now are starting to lay that foundation of of pause and saying to people in the future, hey, don't be so fast to run with this and just take a minute to think about the implications. What isn't this, right? And so starting to ask that question can be as important and, and sometimes more important than what it is. Thanks. Thank you. There's a question from the chat. Sean Kelly wrote, are there special cases of Markov blankets that shield internal states, a Markov shield? So, would any of the authors like to just give a response to that? Yeah, Yella, and then go ahead, Steve. I can, I can give it a try. Um, of, of course, th th this really uh, depends on what you mean by shielding, uh, right? And uh, I think in the paper, and also in I mean, in the paper, we use a statistical notion of shielding uh, that is pretty much equivalent uh, to conditional independence, right? So, if if you have three nodes and there's one intermediate node, such that knowing the intermediate node will 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 mean that knowing the third node doesn't not mean anything, doesn't give you anything for for knowing your first node. Uh, then that's a notion of shielding in the in in in, in the uh, in the sense that the second node kind of epistemically shields off uh, uh, the the activity at the at the third node from 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 whatever happens at the first node. And this is an epistemic notion of uh, epistemic and statistical notion of shielding. And also that one, right? I mean, shielding has a lot of kind of more everyday kind of connotations that are necess not necessarily kind of congruent with the statistical uh, uh, notion. But if you mean the statistical notion, then yes, the very definition of a Markov blanket is that the things inside of the blanket are given the Markov blanket shielded off from the rest of the world in that statistical sense. Thank you. That was what I was thinking. Uh, insulation, like a heat insulator is shielding it. And so that is kind of what these nodes are doing statistically. And then we're nuancing what kinds of, of categories these nodes might fit into. And that's a key difference between Pearl's phrasing and Friston's phrasing is the extent to which nodes are classified into different kinds. So Stephen, and then anyone else. Yeah, I think that question about how things, um, when we scale up, um, is really important. And in predictive 
processing and the modeling, you know, you have this hierarchical model of things going up to higher levels. And yeah, there could be this implicit suggestion that each of those steps or somewhere up there, it's going to other size blankets, but it may not be that blankets are needed as much um, to go another layer. It might be that there is some sort of process structure that is doing the job yeah, at lower levels. It's a more active inference process. And if I could give one metaphor, there was a metaphor I'd put on about if there's a flag stuck in some mud and it looks quite stable, but it's blowing in the wind. OK, and then I have another flag which is stuck in some mud. It's actually the top of an ant hill, and underneath the ants are all swarming to hold it still. So and it's actually a little bit more still, but actually the hole's more open. So in the first case, it's energetically, thermodynamically more at a, an equilibrium. It's being held in a, in a in a one place. The second one, you think it's in more of a thermodynamic equilibrium because it seems more firm, but actually there's a whole swarm of ants underneath trying to hold it in place. And but none of them have got that intention. But looking from the outside, the system is holding the flag. But from the point of view of from the ants, they're trying to enact some sort of action policy. And I suppose, I wonder if there's something similar between you know, the system as seen from the outside as a state and the kind of swarming that's going on underneath and that the two can get mixed up sometimes. Thanks, Stephen. Um, always a great, uh, challenge and eternal question, what are the ants trying to do? But what you just pointed out there is is really, it's related to this distinction they draw with these four different cases. The difference between a generative model, which is like the modeler's perspective on a, something versus the generative process. And so those are two different generative processes that are giving rise to the movement of these two different flags. Let's say there's two different processes underlying it. Those are realist claims about what is giving rise. And then there's all different kinds of perspectives that can be taken. Um, but if we mix up two people's perspectives, or if we mix up a generative model and a generative process, it's a category error. And if we're coincidentally correct, it would be miraculous because it'd be a, a, the wrong kind of thing that's being considered. So it is extremely important to, um, prevent that kind of misinterpretation by really asking, are we talking about the process, the generative process or the generative model? And sometimes even just that distinguishing as well as this fourfold uh, uh, classification raised here, these go a long way towards helping model. So Scott, and then anyone else? Since we have Europeans on the line, I'd like to talk about Kant for a second. And I want to display my ignorance of Kant um, and the categorical imperative. So it, 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 I, I complain about the categorical imperative because I, if can one person know enough, have enough situational awareness so that their good act can translate into goodness in the world? And again, maybe that's a total misinterpretation of Kant or maybe just got it all wrong. But in the same way, I wonder about Markov blankets and this notion of knowledge of an awareness um so that because uh, because that one of the problems we see in the world is even a good actor if they don't have good in, in, information can do bad things like in the sustainable development goals of the united nations they put in a gujarat power plant was funded by a un based financing agency and it cost them a billion dollars or whatever. And they were crowing about the success of sustaining sustainable development goals in, of energy and development were being pursued and furthered. But what they didn't talk about, and they then got sued in, in a court over, is the fact that the local fishermen and local population, there was pollution. And so it poisoned the local waters and the local population with the pollution. So they didn't do a sufficient analysis even in this situation where they're trying to improve the world and listing out all these goals of the world that's their declaration that's their amsterdam flag of what they're trying to do with the un right so but nonetheless they pursued one goal at the expense of other goals 
And one of the things I'm interested in, your thoughts, you can go into Kant if you want, and also correct me on my bad Kantian non-interpretation there. But um, can you comment a little bit on awareness and knowledge? We talked about group and individual Markov blankets, but can we talk a little bit about that notion about sharing of knowledge and situational awareness just as a survival strategy? In the ants were surviving in the um, Shannon's uh, tilting bridge example before, um, which was a survival thing. In Stephen's flag projection, that was a little bit more the answer, a little bit uh, smarter uh, about their externalities in that one. Anyway, but can, can you comment a little bit about how do we get, how, how might these analyses and these models and their implementations in reality and in the lab help us to understand the nature of group information flow? Thanks for the question. So if anyone has a thought, yep, Gela, go for it. And then anyone else? Great, I, I, I'll give it a try. I'm not sure if I can tie it all the way back to the categorical imperative, but that's, uh, let, let, let's give it a go. Um, so I, I think the first thing that the, the way I understand it, uh, the kind of active inference framework is really a theory of learning for a particular kind of uh, environments. So in a sense, Organisms start to learn to adapt to the specific niche niche that they are that they are uh, uh, engaged in, and then somehow slowly build up a particular model of that particular kind of niche uh, that you can, of course, and that 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 model you can use also for hypothetical kind of situations or counterfactuals or or, or, or new kind of situations. But there's no guarantee that this kind of previous history. Uh, uh, I mean, if you if you if you enter a new niche or if the world changes, it's, it, it's not guaranteed that your previous knowledge will be, uh, uh, will be specific to the new situation or will, be, will work in, that, in the new particular kind of situation. Um, so I guess there that, that indeed the, the kind of active inference framework gives you a perspective on uh, 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 situated situation specific knowledge and not on a kind of categorical the uh, domain general uh, uh, knowledge and so this doesn't gu that guarantee indeed that if you use your uh, use your model to make inferences about new situations that that that, that you will um, uh, uh, end up on, on on the right result uh, and so that gap between what will be your best action according to whatever kind of imperative you set for yourself in reality and how it works out that's always a gap in 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 in, in the knowledge that you have uh, which indeed is related to the difference between the, the kind of the causal dynamics of the world, the, the generative process, and uh, the generative model of the world that you that, that you have. And so I guess that that that's indeed why, perhaps I mean, speculating that that different kind of ethical frameworks might 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 fit better in such a kind of approach rather than a, a, a deontological one. That was very. Oh yeah, go ahead, Chris. Chris. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to follow up on this uh, a little bit because we the the, the notion you know of the dis the distinction between the generative model and the generative process was brought up before and now Yela alluded to it, and I think it's really important to keep in mind that the free energy principle. So so the gener maybe let's start differently. The generative process right is supposedly the process or the the the, the causal process that produces certain sensations in an organism. And then the generative model is supposed to be on this framework producing predictions, right? Which which kind of explain away in the Bayesian sense uh, the, the sensations that the model is uh, that, 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 that the organism is experiencing. And the idea that's implicit in a lot of the literature is that you know you have the generative process on this side, you have the generative model that's trying to mirror the generative uh, process. There's the sensory sheet in the middle. And that these two these two things will somehow you know fold onto each other and they will be just perfect. Uh, there will be some kind of a perfect resemblance or mapping between them. Um, and that's not entirely. It's not entirely clear that this this is the most uh, successful evolutionary successful strategy. So the generative model only needs to recapitulate the generative process to the extent that it's successful for in a given ecological niche or even social niche 
to ensure the survival and reproduction of the organism, right? Um, and so, so, so that's one thing that I think important to remember about this: that that you know, the free energy principle from the get-go kind of does not necessarily produce agents that are perfectly that will be always um, optimally informed about what's going on in their surroundings. They just kind of really they they learn just enough to stay alive. And of course, uh, the inclusion of active inference gives them an advantage over traditional Bayesian agents because they can also go and try things out and, and learn in this way. Uh, but it still doesn't give take us all the way, so to speak, uh, to, to 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 kind of transcend our model and 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 get to know the the process that that that's out there in the world. Uh, and I think this is also true in the social domain in many ways. So, so in the social domain, I think it's very plausible that the same thing happens. And we could expect that the same thing will happen for, I don't know, groups, for example, uh, where, where groups will form certain models about how society operates or how the world is, which will be optimal to their given epistemic situation and their given social situation, but will not be objective uh, models of how the how society or, or the world operates thanks and what you just said there at the end about the cultural ways of viewing the world it's um known that many cultures their own name for their own country or homeland might be like this is the middle spot or this is like the main place it makes sense and it it's um it's unsurprising that it's that way but then, just like Scott said, we're all comparing notes. That's the phase of our test that we're in. And two people are mapping to a different territory with the same relative egocentric map. And so this question about how different egocentric perspectives and at which level uh, those egocentric perspectives exist at, how those come into harmony is really an interesting question. So Stephen... And then anyone else who'd like to speak? And yeah, this is awesome times. It's been a great discussion. And we have 20 minutes or however much more people would like. Yeah, I just like to, I really thought that was a really interesting point there about when other approaches are maybe better than taking an ontological approach. And I suppose it, I think, and you talk about the epistemological approach, I suppose that you get into this question of whether it's a more fuzzy, I'd be interested in your thoughts on like, fuzzy logic and a more fuzzy based epistemology um, rather than maybe the type of logical categorization of knowledge which ends up becoming ontological at some point and that there is this idea of ontological pluralism that there's sort of their way around this you know or third wave is that the, the third wave inactive consciousness has that this idea that the markov blanket because it breathes with different regimes of attention you sort of trying to get around that problem but there is it doesn't necessarily say how they do that so i'd just be curious yeah a bit more and and, and the other thing if it's tying in with other areas is like for instance they, they're talking about affect now a lot and affect is this kind of integration which then ties in in qualitative research where you have axiology which is kind of the, the normally this thing which is sort of down there in arts-based methods but you know the the one where it's about how people feel about things. Well, now that starts to become part of a lot of what we're understanding about the world. So it could actually have quite an implication for participatory, interactive kind of research methods and making them much more central in a way. So I wonder any of your thoughts on that, about, about that from the authors. Thanks, Stephen. If anyone has any thoughts on that or can raise their hand at yeah, Yella, go for it. Um, I mean, so so I guess what, what we do in our paper is a little bit before that that, that step, right? So uh, on the question of uh, uh, ontology versus, versus epistemology, should you go for a kind of ontological pluralism uh, 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 or not? I think what we try to say is that, uh, uh, look, here's a, here's a class of models that are typically used in the literature as abstractions from a target uh, phenomenon, right? And so if you want to understand those uh, uh, 
in kind of ontological terms that that's that's fine but you need to give a, a story about how how that abstraction relates to the target phenomenon uh, 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 that is that that is there so either uh, if you go into metaphysics you go for a kind of more uh, Platonist kind of route and you say well, well actually this mathematical model is not an abstraction from the target system but it actually nature at its joints is somehow mathematically structured um, or you you say like look no these, these are these are indeed abstractions produced by us and they, they they're useful in predicting and interpreting the world uh, but they are not themselves the the, the, the world uh, so in a sense we, we, we kind of offer the, the kind of dilemma to anyone who, who who wants to make a commitment or a choice there between epistemology or ontology or ontological pluralism um saying like look you you, you can go the ontological route and uh of course this is a way more challenging interesting kind of exciting uh, uh, route but then you either need to write this this this, this bullets that, that that these models are not really abstractions but somehow on the live reality or need to give some some other sort, sort of story about how that uh, uh, how that works, and uh, I'm, 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 I think personally, I'm curious to see what 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 the response from from the community will be, uh, which of those uh, uh, op options people will take. But uh, I mean, I don't think either of us is necessarily committed to one of those those, 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 those routes or not. But just saying, okay, look, if you want to do it, then these are th these are the rules, kind of so to say. Uh, I mean, maybe disagree with the rules, that's fine as well. But then give a, give an argument for for that. Thanks. Very interesting stuff. Anyone else have any thoughts? Uh, yeah, Stephen, and then anyone else go for it. Yeah, I think that, that I, I agree a lot with what you're saying there. I think there's, there are some gaps in, um, and, and rather than saying there's a gap, sometimes it's just filled with the Markov blanket, if that makes sense. Um, if in doubt, fill it with the Markov blanket. And I, I've been really curious. I'm, I'm actually looking a lot. Um, in terms of how organisms structure, like the idea of peripersonal space and and spatial inactive ecological approaches, and and the way that maybe there's a a way that that space is actually um, and there's a field called mental space psychology, which has been a very fringe field. Um, actually, a lot of it based in Holland, and that um, is uh, it seems more plausible now with this. So it was a much more of a practice-based approach, but um, I, I thought I'd share that anyway because I'm presenting something this Friday. So, um, but it's it, I, I do think there's something missing in terms of um, mechanisms that extend out beyond the body into the space, and it may not have to be um, at all levels. Friston's blankets in 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 the traditional sense. Shannon, and then anyone else? Um, I'm going to talk about brains. So I know we've been extending, you know, into the world and into the body, um, into the body and everything. Um, and we've been talking a lot about group dynamics and maybe how groups behave or how we feel like part of a different group. Um, and earlier, we super briefly touched on mirror neurons. Um, so these are neurons that fire when I observe an action, the same as when I do an action. Um, and there's been a lot of work lately, not necessarily on mere neurons, but on interbrain synergies, or you might call them interbrain coherence or cross brain coherence, where lots of dynamics in my brain are firing very similar to lots of dynamics in your brain. Um, and this could be because, um, like in work from Mary Hassan on neurocinematics, this could be because we're watching a film and it's evoking similar responses because we're all attending to the same stimulus. But the film that we're watching, it could have a structure where the filmmaker sort of designs what you pay attention to. Um, and so most people's gazes will fall in that direction. Um, you'll have even more similar sort of interbrain coherence or unstructured where you're just sort of filming a scene and there's maybe some people over here, some people over there and your gazes will could differ a little bit more. These structures could differ a little more. Um, and this 
is all to say how, like the, the film is the environment in this case. And if we're talking about the rest of the world being the environment or like us in this room being the environment, our gaze is structured in a certain way by there's a blue box on my Jitsi screen. So it's sort of directing everyone's attention at my face. Um, but there's also some lack of structure. I don't know that we're seeing the same tiles in every space. Um, and there's different ways that if we interacted, like if I interacted with one of you a lot in my daily life, like maybe Steven and I hang out and get coffee every day and we talk about something every single day. So we have a, a propensity to pay attention to similar things in similar ways. And we've been specifically talking about Yella's idea and how much we agree or disagree with it or something. So we are continually like drawing our gaze to Yella to see if he understands um, or agrees with what we're saying. Like there might be this similar interbrain coherence between Stephen and I that's different between me and Blue because Blue and I never talk. We're not even friends. Um, these are all hypothetical, by the way. Um, and these, so a question, it's not, you know, um, in your paper necessarily, but like if we're looking for Marka blankets in the world, one thing that we could look at is something like a interbrain coherence. And that might be something real in the world, or it might be a pearl blanket, something that we use to describe how people interpret something the same or how their brain activities are synergistic in a certain way. Um, and if you can be empirical, um, I know we were being rhetorical a lot of times, but if you can be empirical and look at these signatures of either you know, conversation dynamics or brain dynamics and can relate them to how the world is structuring them, then that's a way that you can look for you can still keep looking for Markov blankets in the world or find it useful. Um, it's definitely, I think, what we keep coming back to when we're talking about um, these blankets as a metaphor, or these blankets as something real, is that we can totally have both as long as we're specific about which one we're referring to. Thank you, Shannon, Yella, and then anyone else. Thanks, Shannon. That, that's really interesting. Um, and I think that there, 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 there's there, there's a couple of things there, right? I mean, and, and indeed, in one sense, if two people have the same same background, same experience, or so, right? They might they might parse a particular kind of movie or scene in 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 in, in a similar kind of way, such that if you put them in in, in rooms separate from each other, you you, you will indeed see a similar kind of neural dynamic uh, 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 going on in both in both cases maybe tied indeed to attention where you pay attention you gaze etc um the other one is indeed kind of on-site kind of interpersonal synchronization that might be happening right and i know there's this kind of it's kind of second person neuroscience kind of approaches that that, that that try to capture those kind of things in an experimental setting and see how 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 in what particular kind of settings brain waves synchronize and uh, etc. Um, and that kind of second perspective reminds me a lot of uh, uh, of the kind of discussion that's there in active inference on generalized synchronization. Right. So th these are the kind of examples that you get when as there's uh, uh, two two coupled clocks standing on the table and they tend to synchronize after after a while. So this is a very simple causal mechanism. Uh, causal structure where, where synchronization just occurs over 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 time, um, and when I first started thinking about uh, 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 Marco blankets, I, I I used that kind of example as a kind of reductio ad, abs ad absurdum, saying like, look, if if these things even have a Marco blanket, right, then it's an empty uh, 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 empty notion. Now, ha having worked with these with these philosophers of science here, I think I think we need to be a bit more more more, more specific and indeed say, look. Okay, whether that thing has or has not a Marco blanket, that that that's that, that that's a different question. But there's there is a point that there is a very uh, uh, simple structure of kind of causal dependence and causal independence, such that if you would fix the table perfectly, the things would not synchronize, 
And if you would let it slide a little bit and wobble a little bit, then they would they, they, they do synchronize. So there is this kind of thing, like this intermediate factor that mediates a causal relationship between those uh, 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 those two things. Now the question is, is that, do you need to have a marker blanket for that? Does Marco, do marker blankets add anything there? Or is it kind of st story about kind of causal dependence and causal independence uh, 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 enough? Uh, I think that, well, uh, uh, causal dependence there and causal independence such that if I would do this, then there would be no synchronization. I think that's enough. And then what do you call that? A kind of... Markov blanket is, is is a second kind of question. You need to translate it back to the kind of world of, of causal models and, and and see how they relate to that. Uh, but I think there's, there's yeah there's a the clear case to be made that, that there's this parallel between the kind of cases you're describing and the kind of synchronization settings that are there in in in, in these kind of corporate clock uh, examples. Thanks. And one interesting aspect to kind of bring it back to this discussion about the internet you know what kind of beliefs propagate culturally on what kind of connectivity uh just like shannon was saying with the video chat and with the live stream what somebody sees it's not just that, like they're sitting in a different chair at the theater and they're watching the same play or they're in separate movies uh you know rooms watching the same movie and so cultural cues might lead somebody to look into a, a correlated position as another person. But um, when there's the customization, it's like each person is in their own theater, which takes it to another level because it goes even, be, it, it's actually different inputs and the inputs can be targeted in interesting or new ways. So it's kind of stretching the limits of our social cognition because it's not just a bunch of people asking what they just saw with a shared event. It's like trying to come to a shared understanding when people are seeing different events. So yeah, there's some new fun things we're learning on the internet, I guess. <laughs> well, in the last couple of minutes, if anyone has some thoughts, I'd be curious to the authors or non-authors, where do we go from 20.2? Where's our momentum or direction or curiosity? One thing I'll bring up while someone's raising their hand is uh, without uh, buzzing in the middle of a conversation, how can we be really clear when we're intentionally or unintentionally slipping the difference between a Markov, for Pearl, Friston blanket and generative model, generative process with a model, within a model. We don't want to police subtleties of language, but at the same time, somebody can really build a bridge that leads someone to nowhere if they're unintentionally uh, not sure of the difference between these concepts. So I'm just curious, how do we promote uh, rigorous and accessible norms around talking about these ideas, recognizing that we're all like totally learning this and, and formalizing the project around us? So Yella, and then anyone else. Uh, just a small uh, note, and I'm not, I don't remember exactly who, who mentioned this, but uh, at some point we talked about kind of two phases of research, right? And one is kind of taking a an ID and running along, pushing it along as, as as far as you can. And then there is a new kind of phase where like, okay, now we ended up in a, in a completely new new place. Uh, how, how, how are we gonna kind of substantiate this? How can I make, kind of formalize this a little bit? And I think, this is the, the kind of the, I guess, over the last few years, active inference and also the philosophy of active inference has kind of been just, and also, I mean, also in my own earlier papers, kind of been running as far as possible, see how far we could get this and see what would happen as a kind of creative kind of, kind of startup stage of, 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 of research. And I think both in this paper and in a number of other papers that are currently kind of com coming out, um, uh, I think this kind of more kind of consolidatory phase, consolidatory phase is, is happening where we're like, okay, that, but okay, this is where we ended up. That, does it really make sense? Need, do we need, need to make some f more fine grain demarcations to, to, do we need to tweak the conceptual apparatus to, 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 have, to have it all make sense? Uh, and that, it, it's, it's a different kind of work, but, but I think that that's, that's, that's really important in the kind of, for the next kind of phase for, for, for active inference uh, research. So I hope these kind of discussions can contribute to uh, uh, to doing that kind of work. 
we're consolidating Bitcoin to the key twenty thousand dollar level. You know, let it rest before the next. Uh, <laughs> Maybe, yeah, yeah. <laughs> whatever metaphor works for people. But um, any other thoughts? Because that's very nice, yellow. Thanks everyone for sharing. This was an awesome sequence, and it really helped take our our lab and our discussion to another level. We would always welcome any of you to come back to continue the conversation, come for a guest stream, come as a visitor to um, be on any conversation you'd like. So thanks again to everyone and for listening. Peace.